And the reason is, is that you're not supposed to do pilgrimage running. Oh. You have to be mindful, thoughtful, thoughtful mm. of every step that we're taking. And I'm gonna tell you, right underneath that bubble, see that light bubble? Yeah. You can't see it right now. It means you already have to come back, but there is a coin. There's a coin? There's a coin under there. I'm gonna show you a picture of it. Thanks for meeting me here. I'm so excited to show you some amazing things. I have heard that you have so much knowledge of this area. So my first question is, where are we? But hey. Hi. <laughs> hey. Welcome to the city of David. Wow. This is the ancient city of Jerusalem. If you want to understand what Jerusalem really is, you have to kind of peel away all the layers and go back to the beginning where it started. Here on this small little hilltop, just south of the Temple Mount, south of the old city, this is ancient Jerusalem, the ancient city of David. And I want to show you what that looks like. Yes. Okay, so right now we are standing right down here. Okay. Right at the bottom of this little hill, right? There's a valley on this side. This is the Kidron Valley. Very famous valley where David it's runs away, weird. right? Yeah. Big, big stuff happening, the Mount of Olives. We have another valley down here. We're going to walk up this. And in between these two valleys is the ancient city of David. This spot right outside the old city was covered in fields. Wow. Total fields, right? This part, this Everything, part. Wow. everything. The steps that we're about to walk up, totally covered in fields. No one knew this was here. People would have said, oh, Sheila, you want to go see ancient Jerusalem? Go up to the old city, go up to the Temple Mount, go up to the Western Wall, go to the Garden Tomb, right? Go up there. That's where ancient biblical Jerusalem was. And it was because all of this just lied, waiting patiently, almost like the lost city of Atlantis. Gives me chills. Right? And then, by, quite by mistake, right? A man by the name of Captain Charles Warren, he's sent by Queen Victoria in 1867. He, she says, I want you to go dig on the Temple Mount, right? Find remnants of biblical temples. And uh, he can't because the Temple Mount is totally closed off. And he goes down to the main source of water. He ends up finding a whole system of tunnels and he uncovers that ancient Jerusalem is here. Oh my gosh. Quite the same way, by the way, that David originally enters the city when he has to attack right? The last part that's left. And he gets there with all of his men. He's the one that's crowned. People know him. And they say, we're going to go to Jerusalem. We're going to create the first capital of the people. And that's what this place is going to be. And it's going to be significant there on, right? Because if you look at this city, the city is impossible to conquer. Yeah. I mean, it's high up. It's high up. It's surrounded by walls. Surrounded by walls. The only source of water is totally surrounded. This is the only place in the world where you can see 150 foot remnants of a Canaanite fortress. Wow. And he stands down here and the king of the Jebusite city looks down and he says, you can't come here unless you go through the blind and the lame. Wow. Meaning I could put blind and lame people on my walls. I know what you're thinking. You're going ahead, right? We're going to, we're going <laughs> to get, I know it. I can read exciting. you. exciting. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And David says, Anyone who can infiltrate the water system, climb up a tunnel behind the enemy lines, open up the city, he's going to do that. And that's what happens is Joab, Joab, he's going to climb up this tunnel underneath the city, open up the gates. Jerusalem is born. History's changed forever. And it's the same way that thousands of years later, Captain Charles Warren is hiking up a random tunnel in the middle of fields. And he discovers ancient Jerusalem. There's something that's connective here. Wow. It's pretty exciting to be here while actual excavation is going yeah. on. What, what is this site? In yes. Particular? So this site brings us to actually another incredible story that happened by chance. If you would have come here before 2004, there was a road here and there was a big garden. I kind of showed you a picture of it, right? We're standing right here, all of these yeah. trees. And what happened was there was a snowstorm and a pipe exploded. And they said, all right, we got to fix the road. They bring in some excavators and they bring in an archaeologist. He says, wait a second, I got to make sure there's nothing, you know, important. old here, important. Yeah. And they hear scraping and he says, there's something here, we got to dig. And he starts digging and he finds these steps. You see these? One, two, three, five steps and then a larger step. And then five more steps down here. And then he finds a corner. Do you see the corner right behind you? Yeah. So once he finds that corner, he says, wait a second, I have uncovered the most incredible discovery. Oh, of wow. my career, right? The Pool of the Siloam, the ancient Siloam Pool. Now, this pool originally was built by Hezekiah to save the city from the Assyrians. Later, it was renovated by Herod, and we have a pool that is about the size of two Olympic pools put together. This is the most important site 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem. If you were coming then, and I was your guide, we would definitely start here. 
And what would we do? We would immerse yeah. in this ritual bath. Wow. Because in order to go up to the temple, you'd have to be holy. Purification. Yes. So this would be the purification center three times a year. Thousands of people from all over the country are going to come here and pass over Pentecost, Tabernacles. They're going to immerse in this pool and they're going to experience the most spiritual moments of their lives. Now, what you're seeing behind us is really new. We finally have been able to start excavating the pool in its entirety. So really, you're seeing history kind of being uncovered, not unfolding because it's here. It's yeah. waiting for us, but it's being uncovered again for our eyes to see. You know what's amazing to me, Franny, is that I've had the privilege of going to so many different spots. Yeah. And in many of them, it's like, well, Jesus could have walked here because that was my heart. I want to walk in the footsteps yeah. of Jesus. This is one place where I can say 100% without a shadow yeah. that Jesus was here. Yes, this site, 100%. If you were Jewish 2,000 years ago, and you were in Jerusalem, you were definitely on these steps and about to walk up where we are going to walk up now because it didn't just start at the pool. And we have this, you know, the famous um, stories of the Siloam pool, which yeah. I'm sure are like... Oh gosh, yeah, John's what, gospel. Right, or yeah. sitting in your head. Yeah, the, bl the blind man um, where Jesus spits on mud and puts it on his eyes and then tells him to go wash in this pool. Go wash in this pool. This is that pool. And what we're going to do now is something that really for thousands of years has not been something you could do. Today, you can stand here at the Pool of Siloam, and together we can actually continue walking because the story didn't end when he finds this pool. He continues digging and he finds a tunnel. And in that tunnel, he's like, what is this thing, right? He's digging and digging and digging and the tunnel's going all the way up. And he uncovers something quite spectacular and it's going to be groundbreaking. He uncovers the ancient pilgrimage road. So meaning people started at the pool, but their goal was the temple, right? They started here and this was their journey that they were going to take. And I would say if there's anything that is amazing to do in Israel, this is probably number one. So we're starting here and we're gonna do our own pilgrimage. Oh gosh, Franny, lead on. So you can see here, we have, you know, kind of a, an expanded version of the picture that I showed you. Pool of Asylum, and we have this beautiful road. Now, it's not like a road of today, yeah. right? We're talking about, it's massive, like yeah. a highway, but for people, yeah. right? 12, 13 yards wide. You're actually standing on that right now, and on either side, you have homes ascending all the way up to what would have been the temple. The temple would have stood right where the golden dome is. That is called the Dome of the Rock. Yeah. And if you would go in there today, there would be a big rock. That rock is the foundation stone. The place where Abraham does the binding of Isaac. Oh, wow. The place where Jacob dreams the ladders, right? The place where the first Holy of Holies stood in the, in the first temple, and in the second temple, the second Holy of Holies. And so we're talking about that's the goal. That's the end goal of this ascent. It makes so much sense of the Psalms that say, let us go up yes. to the house of the Lord. Yes. I've noticed that a lot and never really quite understood what that would look like for people. So I think that it's interesting that you bring that up because when you think of that, let us go up. Yeah. This path is called in Hebrew, derech ole regel, which means the path of going up by foot. Now, before we uncover this, what would you think? Like, why is it called going up? Is Jerusalem really the highest place? No. No, physically it's not. So why is it called going up? It's a spiritual ascent. Wow, you're I love You're spiritually that. going up, and that's what we thought. But I have to show you the road because you're gonna feel it's not just spiritual, we are really going up to wow. Mount Moriah. Wow. So come this way. So here we have, we've redone it a little bit, right? <laughs> but this is an entryway to what would have been a home and a shop, right? Wow. People lived on the road and you have hundreds of thousands of people. It could go for millions, right? It's like imagine every year, this city has to get ready for the Olympics. Okay? Yeah. People are coming and the people are coming from all over. Maybe they need food. Maybe they need a new goat because they need a, a sacrifice and their goat got blemished on the way. Maybe they want a new dress. This became not only a spiritual site, but tourists. So in Jewish law, it's interesting to see that people who lived in Jerusalem, they had law, Jewish law, that they had to accept the pilgrims and give them for free 
a place to sleep, and basic food and drink. Wow. Meaning you had to reach out to the other. You had to reach out to your brothers that come from far, whatever political side you're on, whatever religious side you're on, you had to bring them in. These are the foundations of, I would say, the Judeo-Christian you know, values that even America was built on, wow. right? And this starts here. So what were they selling? We need to get back to that. Yes. That is yes. powerful. Yes. Where it's about the other. It's about the other. Mm -hmm. It's we're coming together yeah. under God. Yeah. Right? And so they did sell things, but it was the extra things. You yeah. want a new outfit. You want a new goat. You need, I don't know. Who doesn't need a new goat? You need goat? a new towel because yeah. you just, you know, went yeah. in the, right, the silo home. But it was, but the basic, basic was you're invited. You're here. And there was a, a miracle that happened that no one ever complained that there wasn't enough space in Jerusalem. Wow. Yeah. So with this. There's so much to learn here. Yeah. We're not going to buy anything this time. No. We're going to go on our own spiritual journey and we're going to walk up the okay. steps. And these steps. This is our way. So we're walking on the original steps. I want you to notice that there's a break in the road. There's a drainage tunnel that runs under the road. And there are these two full pots that were clearly brought into the drainage tunnel for whatever purpose. We'll talk about it at the end. But notice that there are breaks. Yeah. And we'll talk about them. But let's focus on the steps. Right now we are ascending. We are starting our own And song these of are the original, original steps. Nothing has been changed here. Gosh. And look how beautiful they're preserved, right? Like thousands of years later. And the reason they're preserved is because they literally stood underground for so long. We've actually been allowed to go behind the scenes of the dig and continue walking up the road to the Temple Mount that is usually closed to the public. But we've been given special access. So interestingly, another thing is these steps are not even. There are some that are long, some that are short. You'll see that in a minute there's like random ones. And the reason is, is that you're not supposed to do pilgrimage running. Oh. You have to be mindful, thoughtful, mm. thoughtful of every step that we're taking. And I'm gonna tell you, right underneath that bubble, see that light bubble? Yeah. You can't see it right now. It means you already have to come back, but there is a coin. There's a coin? There's a coin under there. I'm gonna show you a picture of it. Take a seat over here, and I want to tell you a story. I want to tell you the story of this space. I love stories. <laughs> well, this one's full of them, right? I could, mm -hmm. we could talk here for a while. But we're sitting right in the middle of this pilgrimage road, right? We started at the Pool of Asylum, and we're on our way up. And the story here is one of unity, right? Of bringing people from all over the world together through, you know, community and through spirituality and Jerusalem. Yeah. Like imagine we were sitting here 2,000 years ago and you would see people coming up and you would hear songs and music and, wow. and dancing and it would be really the most spiritual time of their lives, right? This would be a place where if we took a break, right, and we would sit, you would think, what am I doing here, right? What's the purpose of me coming here? And it really is kind of threefold, right? We have our day-to-day -day life that we go about and we, you know, have our things that we have to do. Right. This would be a place where we say, okay, wait a second. I'm, I'm leaving that for a minute. I'm taking time to check in with myself, right? Where am I internally? Where am I spiritually? And we meet our brothers. Like, where am I with my community? Are we doing what we need? Are we really helping each other out? Are we, are we standing for the right things together? Are we having disputes that maybe we don't need to be having? Mm. And then thirdly, people would come here and they would see, you know, it would be meeting with God, right? We're coming up to do this worship. They would bring up this road, their Passover sacrifice. This would be the place where they would bring up the water from the Shiloh for the most like spiritual and happy celebration during tabernacles. This was the spot. But the story doesn't end so well. Right below there, right, we saw you saw the drainage tunnel, yeah. the gutter. Yeah. And that gutter runs all along this road. That's how we actually discover the road, right? And you saw these pots that I showed you. Yeah. So what's happening there? And I also showed you there's a, there's a coin on the road. I want to tell you that the most important find, I think, that we found on this road 
are those pots and that coin. We find a number of them, by the way, and I'm going to show you a picture of them. And obviously, this is my opinion. But these are those pots that you saw, and this is that coin. Now, this coin says in ancient Hebrew, for the freedom of Zion, year three. Freedom of Zion. What is this talking about? It brings us to year 70. Year 70, Titus comes to Jerusalem underneath Vespasian, and he totally destroys everything. Burns down the temple, and he massacres. Josephus writes that the road itself is flowing with blood. And I want you to imagine that time period, right? That awful, those awful days of Jerusalem. And really, I'll tell you, if you ask Jewish people, they'll say, hey, why was Jerusalem destroyed in year 70? We will say something different. We won't say the Romans came in and destroyed it. We will say because of baseless hatred. That's what little, you know, that's what we're taught. Why? Josephus writes that there's a road, right? And on one side of the road, you have priests and Levites, and they're working in the temple, and they have money, and, you know, there's higher taxes from Rome. Live and let live, no big deal. On the other side of the road, there are poor people that hate Rome. They want to be free in Jerusalem. They want to worship how they worship. Politically, they're against those priests and Levites. Religiously, they believe that what's going on in the temple is not the way that God wants. So religiously, they're at ends. Politically, they're at ends. Socioeconomically, they're not even on the same board game, and they're fighting each other. And then within that group, there are zealots that are fighting so hard that they're killing Jewish people that don't believe what they believe. Wow. And the Romans come and they say, all right, they're both killing each other. Let's just put up a siege wall. They'll kill each other. We brought Rome here. We couldn't put aside our political and religious differences and helped each other out. If we would have, perhaps Rome would have been here and like many other cities in Israel, not destroyed Jerusalem. But it got so bad that Titus said, we can't have this in the empire. Let's just burn it all down. And we're done. What are these pots? Josephus says that the last Jews of Jerusalem snuck into the gutters under the road. They brought food with them. They brought their coins. They brought their life. They tried, somehow I'm gonna escape the Romans and didn't work. The Romans discovered it, broke through the road, killed every last one. This is the last spot where we have Jewish presence in Judea for 2,000 years. And if there's something that I want to kind of circle back to, it's David. Mm -hmm. David starts here, right? He writes the bestseller, many of that in this site. But there's something that he does thousands of years ago that changed history. If you look at this map, this is what Israel looks like 3,000 years ago when David comes and makes the first united capital of the people here. Yeah. And why does he do that? But if you look at the map, Jerusalem is located in which tribe? None. It's half in Judah and half in Benjamin. He's the first one to create a city that will be neutral. And he does this because he says, no more are we going to be divided. We will have one city. Everyone can come to this city. No matter which tribe you're from, you can't say you're not, you don't belong. And if you get really deep, Judah is the son of Leah. Benjamin is the son of Rachel. He's taking the wow. brothers and he's saying, we're not, we're not fighting anymore. The cell of Joseph, Benjamin and Joseph versus everyone else. We're not fighting. We are one around this city. His son is going to continue to unite, build the temple, which is called the house of prayer for all nations. And we have to decide. How do we let Jerusalem unite us? Is it through love and through spirituality and through amazing history, right? Or is it through hate? Is it through bad politics? Is it through war? And we have to be the people that say, nope, we are going to allow Jerusalem to unite us through love and through, through light. And I guess that's what the original people on this road were doing. It's such a message to anyone who claims to love and follow Christ, to, to anyone who worships God to allow that to be so much bigger than the little things that divide us. Because honestly, over the last two or three years, particularly in the States, there's been so much division, yeah. even in the church. But what a, what a message David left for us that all are welcome here. We are uniting. We have to be the, we have to be the followers of, of that message, right? And preach it to the world. We have to spread unity and love. And it's hard in our day to day. Yeah. Franny, I don't know how to thank you. I mean, not just the time you've spent with me, but the story you've told me and the history. And I just, 
Thank you, my sister. It's been amazing. It's been such a pleasure. And I hope that you come again, both to the city of David. Everybody has to come to the city of David, but also to Israel. Yeah, I would love it. It's been a pleasure. I just head back like 2,000 years that way. Yes, 2,000 years and you're you're there. Thank you. Bye. Bye. I don't know how this hits you, but to me, it's like we've been part of history today. I mean, to be standing here where they're presently excavating the Pool of Siloam is amazing to me. It's interesting that Jesus only performed two miracles in Jerusalem, and they were both in pools. One by the Pool of Siloam, which we're gonna talk about in a minute, and you read about that in John chapter nine, and the other, there was the, the lame man by the pool of Bethesda, and that's in John chapter five. But we're gonna concentrate, because of our location, on the healing at the pool of Siloam. So let me read to you from John chapter nine. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who'd been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. We must quickly carry out the tasks assigned us by the one who sent us. The night is coming and then no one can work. But while I'm here in the world, I am the light of the world. Then he spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva and spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. He told him, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. So the man went and washed and came back seeing. And you'll probably remember the other miracle that took place in John chapter five, where Jesus saw the man who'd been lame for 38 years lying there. And Jesus asked him a question, do you want to get well? And the man replied by saying, I can't, I don't have anyone to put me in the pool. That was not the question. The question Jesus asked him and the question Jesus asked us is, do you want to get well? And Christ healed that man. But here's what's interesting. I found this out today and I think it's fascinating because from literally Genesis through to Revelation, it's all about Jesus. So I want to read you something from um, 2 Samuel chapter five. And it happens right when David is about to unite all the kingdoms. You'll probably remember the kingdoms were divided, eight tribes in one and two tribes in another. But suddenly they've come to King David and said, you are our king. But here's what happened. There was one piece of land that was left unconquered and it was of course, Jerusalem. This is 2 Samuel chapter five, verse six. David led his men to Jerusalem to fight against the Jebusites, the original inhabitants of the land who were living there. The Jebusites taunted David saying, you'll never get in here. Even the blind and lame could keep you out. Speaking a curse over him and over the people. And of course, as you will remember, David triumphed, but Christ rebukes every curse. It's no accident that in Jerusalem, the two miracles that Jesus was ac accomplished what came against that curse of the blind and the lame. Whatever has been spoken over your life, whatever has been spoken over your family, in Jesus' name, that can be broken. And let me ask you the question he asked that man, do you want to get well? The Lord asked me that question a long time ago. And at first I struggled because I thought, Lord, what will it cost me to get well? What will I have to let go of to get well? But I have to tell you, when you let go of everything you're holding on to and hold on to Jesus, He changes everything. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you that we get to be here in this incredible place where we know that Jesus literally walked here. I am walking in Jesus' footsteps. But Lord, we, we remember, we remember the miracle and we want to say to you, yes, we want to get well. Thank you for coming. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you for the miracles that you have performed. And now we simply say, yes, we want to get well. We will let go of what we are clinging onto. And instead, we will cling onto Jesus. In his powerful name, amen.